How was the world like before the flood? In the ancient world where time seemed to stretch infinitely, humanity took its first steps. The first family, Adam and Eve, planted the seeds of the antediluvian civilization. Enoch, the first city mentioned in the Bible, emerged as a beacon of progress with inventions and achievements that shaped the course of history. But not everything was light. The shadow loomed over the earth. The first murder, brother against brother, stained humanity's innocence. Moral depravity spread, corrupting the hearts of men. Life on antediluvian earth was a giant enigma. Giants walked the land, dinosaurs roamed freely, and humans enjoyed almost unimaginable longevity. The theory of Pangaea suggests that Earth was a supercontinent, a unified world before the Great Division. This is a glimpse of the world before the Flood, an era of wonders and horrors, of innovation and depravity. A time that, despite its distance in the past, still has lessons to teach in modern times. Prepare for a journey into the past to discover what the world was like before the Flood. The story of sin began in heaven, before creating the world and humanity, God already had a numerous and happy family in heaven. In this celestial scenario, there were beloved and obedient sons, God being the father of all angels. God was with his son Jesus, a companion and co-worker in all divine works, distinguished among the angels as the most honored, being the only one capable of fully revealing the love and glory of the Father. Within this celestial group, we also find a special angel named Lucifer, the anointed cherub of the guard, endowed with unparalleled beauty and wisdom. His name meant bearer of light. Enjoying the privilege of being near the divine throne, he reflected the light of God. As the leader of the celestial choir, Lucifer possessed a wonderful and harmonious voice, admired and respected by his brethren. However, one day, something terrible occurred in Lucifer's heart. Fruit of his beauty, wisdom, and power, he began to forget that all of it came from God. His desire to be equal to good led him to yearn for exclusive worship and honor, which belonged only to the Creator. Doubts about the goodness and justice of God arose, questioning God's law of love, spreading lies and slander about God and His Son. Lucifer seduced other angels to his side, planning a rebellion against the divine government and preparing for war in heaven. God, knowing all things, sought to warn and persuade Lucifer of his error. He sent his son to speak and show the danger and folly of his actions, offering forgiveness and restoration if he repented and returned. However, Lucifer rejected God's grace and mercy, hardening his heart and becoming Satan, the adversary of God and all that is good and true. Thus erupted the war in heaven. Satan and his angels, one-third of the angels, faced off against God and his angels led by the Son of God. It was a terrible and violent battle, shaking the entire universe. God and his angels prevailed, defeating Satan and his followers, casting them out of heaven. They lost their place and glory, transforming into demons, fallen angels corrupted by sin. The creation of the world and humanity by God. In the beginning, there was only God. He was the only existing being, and he was made of power, wisdom, and love. He needed nothing and no one but he had a desire to share his glory and goodness with other creatures. Therefore, he decided to create the world and everything in it. God did not need any material or tools to create the world. He only needed his word. With his word, he called into existence everything he desired, and everything he created was good and beautiful. He created the world in six days, and on each day he made something different. The world that God created was perfect and good. He made man and woman in his image and likeness and gave them dominion over the earth. He also gave them the freedom to choose between good and evil and commanded them not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was in the midst of the Garden of Eden. He told them that if they ate from that fruit, they would surely die. This was the only prohibition that God imposed on them to test their obedience and love. However, there was an enemy who hated God and his creation. Satan, a fallen angel who rebelled against God in heaven and was expelled with his followers. He wanted to destroy God's plan and ruin the happiness of mankind. He used the serpent, the craftiest of animals, to deceive the woman. The woman looked at the tree and saw that it was pleasing to the eye and that the fruit was good for food and desirable for gaining wisdom. She doubted God's word and believed Satan's lie. She took some of the fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband, who was
was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, they realized they were naked and felt shame and fear. They sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness and hid from God among the trees of the garden. God, who knew everything that had happened, came to the garden in the cool of the evening and called out to the man, asking, Where are you? The man replied, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So God pronounced his judgment on the serpent, the woman, and the man. To the serpent he said, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. God also made garments of skin for the man and woman and clothed them. And he said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. The story of the first murder involves the first parents of humanity having two sons, Cain and Abel. They were born after their parents were expelled from the Garden of Eden for disobeying God and eating from the forbidden fruit. They grew up in a world different from what God had created a world full of pain, sorrow, and death. They also inherited the sinful nature of their parents, which inclined them towards evil. Cain and Abel were different in character and occupation. While Cain was a farmer dedicating himself to the land with effort and sweat, Abel was a shepherd, caring for the animals with love and dedication. Cain, a proud man, trusted in himself and his works, rebelling against God and murmuring against his justice and law. He despised the guidance of his parents regarding the plan of redemption, not believing in the need for blood for the atonement of sins or in the promised Savior. He thought he could approach God in his own way, hoping to be accepted by his own goodness and merit. On the other hand, Abel, a man who feared God, trusted in divine grace and the promise of a Savior. He obeyed God's commandments, following his parents' instructions regarding the plan of redemption. He knew that without the shedding of blood there was no remission of sins, understanding that the sacrifice of animals pointed to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Both decided to bring offerings to God as acts of worship and gratitude. Cain offered from the fruit of the ground according to his own will, without faith, humility, or reverence. Abel, on the other hand, brought the firstborn of his flock, obeying the divine command. God accepted Abel's offering but rejected Cain's. A light shone from heaven, consuming Abel's sacrifice, showing approval. No light shone upon Cain's offering, demonstrating disapproval. God did this to show the difference between what pleases him and what displeases him, giving Cain the opportunity to repent and change his attitude. However, Cain did not repent or change his ways. Instead, he became angry with God and envy at his brother. He did not accept divine correction or Abel's advice, allowing himself to be dominated by sin. At the door of his heart, he planted an ambush against Abel, calling him to go to the field. There he violently attacked him, killing him with a blow to the head. Seeing what Cain had done, God called him to give an account and asked, Where is your brother Abel? Cain replied with lies and contempt, saying, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? God then pronounced a curse on Cain, making him a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Despite the severity of the punishment, 
Cain did not express remorse for the crime or ask for forgiveness from God. However, God had mercy on him, placing a mark on Cain so that no one would kill him. Anyone who harmed him would be punished seven times over. Cain left the presence of God and settled in the land of Nod, which means wandering, distancing himself further from God. He became the father of the wicked, who multiplied on the earth. He built a city called Enoch, named after his son, attempting to create a civilization without God, based on violence, corruption, and idolatry. Abel, on the other hand, died without leaving children, but his example of faith, obedience, and righteousness remained accepted by God. His name was recorded in the Book of Life and praised in the Bible as a hero of faith. He will be resurrected at the second coming of Christ, living eternally in the kingdom of God. Adam and Eve, saddened by Abel's death and the curse, cried out to God for forgiveness and consolation. God heard their prayer, granting them another son in place of Abel, whom they named Seth, meaning substitute. Seeing in him a sign of God's goodness and faithfulness, they raised Seth in the ways of God, becoming the father of the righteous on earth. This marked the beginning of people calling on the name of the Lord and worshiping with truth and sincerity. The antediluvian civilization was marked by great achievements and inventions. The Bible tells us that the people of that time were very intelligent and skilled, and they developed various arts and crafts. For example, Cain, the first son of Adam and Eve, was the founder of the first city, which he named Enoch in honor of his son, Genesis 4:17. The descendants of Cain also excelled in cattle breeding, music, metallurgy, and agriculture. However, the antediluvian civilization was also dominated by sin, which entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. The Bible tells us that sin manifested in various forms such as murder, violence, corruption, idolatry, immorality, and rebellion against God. The descendants of Cain also engaged in perverse practices like polygamy and witchcraft. It is speculated that the earth was a single continent called Pangaea, although the Bible does not mention Pangaea specifically. However, it does speak about the flood in Genesis 7:11, where it is written, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. It is believed that the water of the flood came from both above and below the earth, which may have caused the separation of the continents. The theory of Pangaea is a mystery and can be an interesting way to understand how the Earth changed over time. Among these mysteries were the giant creatures known as dinosaurs. The existence of these beings has been the subject of much discussion and debate. Although the Bible does not directly mention dinosaurs, it speaks of large sea creatures or monsters that could include these creatures. Furthermore, many scholars argue that dinosaurs may have lived until the time of the Flood. It is believed that this worldwide catastrophe may have led to the extinction of dinosaurs. Before the Flood, humans lived much longer than they do today. The Bible tells us that Adam lived 930 years, Seth lived 902 years, Methuselah lived 969 years, and Noah lived 950 years, Genesis 5. This extraordinary longevity was a reflection of the original perfection of creation, which was affected but not entirely destroyed by sin. God had given man access to the tree of life, which granted them immortality. Without this access and with the degeneration that sin brought, their years were shortened. The environmental conditions of that time were different from the current ones. The temperature was more uniform and mild throughout the earth because there was a water vapor that enveloped the atmosphere, forming a kind of greenhouse. This vapor also protected the earth from harmful solar rays and contributed to the longevity of living beings. Rain did not exist as the earth was watered by vapor rising from the ground. The soil was fertile and rich in minerals, and plants produced fruits abundantly. The animals were tame and peaceful, feeding on plants. Humans were also vegetarians and enjoyed perfect health. There were no diseases, violence, or death. Everything was good as God had made it. This was the situation of antediluvian life before sin entered the world. However, everything changed when humans disobeyed God and ate from the forbidden fruit. Then, sin entered the world, bringing with it death, pain, suffering, corruption, curse, and separation from God. The earth was affected by sin and began to deteriorate. 
Plants began to produce thorns and thistles and the soil became less productive. Animals became fierce predators and began to feed on other animals. Humans became carnivorous and started killing animals for food. The health of humans deteriorated and their lifespan shortened. Corruption and violence plagued humanity. After the first murder, humanity drifted further and further away from God and His law. People multiplied on the earth, but so did their sins. They forgot the Creator and surrendered to their own desires and passions. Morally corrupted, they became violent and cruel. Among them were two distinct groups, the sons of God and the sons of men. The sons of God were the descendants of Seth, who walked with God and kept His commandments. They were righteous, pious, and peaceful eagerly awaiting the Savior who would deliver them from sin and death. The sons of men were the descendants of Cain who rebelled against God and rejected his law. They were wicked, impure, and violent, caring only for worldly things. They were proud, ambitious, and selfish. One day the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took them as wives, disregarding God's counsel. They intermarried with them and had children with them. These children were called Nephilim, which means fallen or giants. They were powerful and renowned men, but they were also wicked and perverse. They ruled the earth with violence and oppression, defying God and His justice. The Nephilim were mighty individuals, perhaps of great stature, who lived in ancient times before and after the flood. Many believe that the Nephilim were giants who were supposedly born from the union between fallen angels and women in the pre-flood period. However, this interpretation is much more fanciful than biblical. The word Nephilim is of Hebrew origin, and its correct meaning is still debated among interpreters. In many translations of the Bible, this word is translated as giants. This mainly happens because the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament, translates the Hebrew Nephilim as the Greek term gigantes, meaning giants. However, perhaps the best interpretation is that the word Nephilim derives from a Hebrew root meaning to fall. So it's possible that the meaning of Nephilim carries a connotation of fallen. Some scholars suggest that this sense of fallen refers to the fallen and depraved nature of the people. Others, however, believe that the correct sense of the meaning of Nephilim should be those who fall upon others. This means that the Nephilim were individuals who subjugated others. If this is correct, then the word Nephilim designates powerful individuals who exhibited violent and tyrannical behavior. The word Nephilim appears only twice in the Bible. The first reference occurs in Genesis 6-4. There were giants, Nephilim, in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. The second reference occurs in Numbers 13-33. And there we saw the giants Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The idea that the Nephilim were not entirely human is based on ancient interpretations of Jewish tradition regarding the text of Genesis 6. These interpretations believe that the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6 were fallen angels who had relations with women. Therefore, supposedly, these women who became pregnant by demons gave birth to the Nephilim. This kind of understanding is reinforced by various non-biblical writings, such as the Book of Enoch. However, the issue is that this interpretation is much closer to ancient legends and mythologies, with their demigods, than to biblical doctrine. Nothing in the context of Genesis 6 suggests this kind of interpretation. Furthermore, the Bible clearly states that angels are incorporeal, asexual beings. Jesus said, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew 22, 30. So, who were the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis 6? The simplest and most coherent answer is that the sons of God were the descendants of Seth who walked with God and kept his commandments. They were righteous, pious, and peaceful. They awaited the coming of the Savior who would deliver them from sin and death. The daughters of men were the descendants of Cain who rebelled against God and rejected his law. They were wicked, impure, and violent. God saw that the wickedness of people had multiplied on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was continually evil. He became saddened by having created humans on earth and it weighed heavily on his heart. 
But why were the Nephilim so powerful if they didn't come from a supernatural crossbreeding? The Bible doesn't provide a definitive answer, but we can speculate on some possibilities. One is that the Nephilim were powerful due to their genetics. Perhaps they inherited a combination of genes that gave them a physical advantage over others. Another possibility is that the Nephilim were powerful because of their culture. Maybe they developed a society based on strength and violence, allowing them to dominate others. A third possibility is that the Nephilim were powerful because of their spiritual influence. Perhaps they were influenced by fallen angels who taught them dark arts and granted them supernatural powers. However, the Nephilim were not invincible or immortal. They were destroyed by the flood that God sent to cleanse the earth of wickedness. Only Noah and his family, who were righteous and faithful to God, were saved in the ark. After the flood, the Bible mentions the Nephilim again as the descendants of Anak, who dwelled in the land of Canaan. They were feared by the spies of Israel, who felt like grasshoppers in their sight. However, they were also defeated by the Israelites, who entered the promised land with the help of God. Noah's Legacy Noah belonged to the lineage of Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. Seth was the replacement for Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain. The lineage of Seth remained faithful to God and his commandments, while the lineage of Cain drifted further away from God and succumbed to violence and corruption. Noah was the tenth descendant of Adam and the ninth of Seth. He was born in the year 1056 after creation and lived 950 years. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. One day, God spoke to Noah and revealed his plan to destroy the earth with a flood because of the wickedness of humanity. However, God also promised to save Noah and his family because of their righteousness. God commanded Noah to build an ark out of wood, providing detailed measurements and specifications. He instructed Noah, along with his wife, his three sons, and their wives to enter the ark. Additionally, God commanded Noah to take a pair of each species of animal and seven pairs of the clean animals and birds. God told Noah that he had 120 years to prepare everything before the flood came. Genesis 6, 13, 22. Noah obeyed God and began to build the ark with the help of his sons. It was hard and time-consuming work that required a lot of faith and perseverance. Noah also preached to his neighbors and those passing by, warning them about God's judgment and inviting them to repent and enter the ark. But no one listened to him. People mocked Noah and his work, thinking he was crazy and fanatic. They continued to live as if nothing would happen, indulging in their pleasures and sins. Genesis 6, 3. Finally, after about 120 years, the ark was ready. God commanded Noah, his family, and the animals to enter the ark, and he closed the door behind them. Then the floodgates of heaven opened, and the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. Genesis 7, 11, 16. The water rose higher and higher, covering the highest mountains and drowning all living creatures upon the face of the earth. Only Noah and those with him in the ark were saved. Genesis 7:17:24. They floated upon the waters, guided by the hand of God. Noah and his family cared for the animals and trusted in God. They spent 40 days and 40 nights inside the ark until the waters began to recede. Noah sent out a raven and a dove to see if the land was dry. The dove returned without finding a place to rest, but after seven days, it came back with an olive leaf in its beak, indicating that life was beginning anew. After another seven days, Noah released the dove again, and it did not return. Genesis 8, 1-12 God spoke to Noah and instructed him, his family, and the animals to leave the ark. Noah built an altar and offered burnt offerings to God, thanking him for their salvation and worshipping him. God was pleased with Noah's sacrifice and blessed him, telling him to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. God also established a covenant with Noah and all creation, promising never again to destroy the earth with a flood. As a sign of this covenant, God placed the rainbow in the sky so that whenever it appeared, he and humanity would remember his promise. Noah left a legacy of faith, obedience, and resilience for future generations. He was the father of a new humanity that received from God a fresh opportunity to live in harmony with him and his creation.
Noah teaches us that we should trust in God and follow his instructions even when they seem foolish in the eyes of the world. He shows us that God is faithful and fulfills his promises and that he has a plan of salvation for those who love and serve him. Just as Noah was saved from the flood by his faith and obedience to God, we too can be saved from the coming judgment through our faith in Jesus Christ and our obedience to him. The return of Jesus is a certain promise and our hope should be anchored in him. May we live in a way that pleases God, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, our Savior and Lord.